Okay, members, the sitting is resumed, and the next item on the order paper is a motion on promoting dementia-friendly policy. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this assembly recognises the need to prioritise and enhance the health and well-being of every person living with dementia and that of their carers in Northern Ireland, highlights the importance of earlier and better diagnosis, effective community and home-based support, as well as high-quality inpatient and residential care in realising better outcomes, notes that transforming public understanding and ending stigma about dementia is integral to ensuring local services and activities are more accessible and everyday life made easier and more enjoyable for those affected, acknowledges the role that the devolved institutions can play in embedding cultural change to this end, and calls on the Minister of Health to work with his executive colleagues to implement a dementia-friendly approach to their responsibilities and decision-making moving forward. Thank you. I call Paula Bradley to move the motion, please. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I first um, start by thanking the Business Committee um, for allowing this to take place today. If I just could interrupt just a wee moment, please, just to outline some of the rest of the business, please, uh, Paula. Uh, thank you for moving. Just a wee bit of detail around this. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. And now I ask you to continue opening the debate, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And apologies for not moving at first and then sitting down in my place. I have to get used to doing that. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to the Business Committee for allowing this um, debate to take place um, here today, and also to all of those parties um, that signed the all-party motion. Um, I first met with Martin Riley and Michael Keenan from the Alzheimer's Society back in February, um, and we had a, a debate and a discussion about bringing a motion forward um, for May time, and then COVID hit, and then we are where we are now. But I'm glad to say that this has taken place today on World Alzheimer's Day, and what is even more special about that is that the, um, their strapline for this year is let's, uh, let's talk about dementia. So I hope that through this debate, we can reduce some of that stigma and we can talk openly in this chamber about how we as an assembly want to bring about changes when it comes to dealing with people with dementia. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not going to come off with too many facts and figures during my uh, time talking, um, but I'll leave that to people who are better than I to come off with those. But what I do want to just say is that at present, there are currently 22,000 people living here in Northern Ireland with dementia, and that's a scary figure. And when I was looking through um, all of the packs that we received and the information that we received, um, something struck me as I read all of that, and it brought back a very early memory to me. Um, and I remember whenever I was a child, I had an aunt who died of dementia at the early age. She was in her early 40s, so she would have been in her late 30s whenever she first had the signs and signals of, uh, it was actually Alzheimer's disease, a very rare form, a very rare genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. And I remember as a child seeing that and not fully understanding what that was, but seeing my aunt who needed help going to the bathroom or who had needed help being fed. And at that time, I was, as I say, I was, I was a child and just approaching teenage years and things weren't discussed in front of us in our house. Everything was discussed. My mum and dad never openly discussed these things. Um, so I never really knew what was going on. But what I do remember about that was that whenever my auntie died, she left behind her two young boys, two very young boys without a mummy and their daddy without a wife. So that just shows you us yet again that dementia can hit and Alzheimer's can hit at any age. And then as I move further slightly on again, I remember my granny, my granny Browning, who was fun loving and full of mischief and uh, kept, a, you know, kept us all, the, the whole family going. She was, I come from a really matriarchal family and she was the matriarch. She was the East Belfast woman, the matriarch of the family um, who, who did everything for us. And I have so many fond memories of my granny. Um, and every Saturday having to either walk the Newton Arch Road, the Craiger Road, the Castlewright Road or the Woodstock. And that was done on a cycle every month that we had to do that, especially to go and look in all the handbag shops. But I remember then um, as, a, as a teenager, my granny had vascular dementia. She was diagnosed with vascular dementia. And I saw this, this fun loving with a little bit of devilment always within her um, change dramatically. And I suppose my granny was really, really fortunate 
because she came from a big family, a big East Belfast family, where she had four daughters and four sons and, four sons and numerous grandchildren. So we were really fortunate that we were able to keep my granny at home, that we were all able to look after her. We all had our own days that we had to spend with her. But I remember all of those, and, and I, you know, we, we laughed about some of the stuff, some of the stuff that she did, and some of the memories we have. And she was always just, you know, just wanting her ma. She just kept saying to me, where's my ma? My ma will be looking for me, where's my ma? But then she thought her ma was my auntie, because she lived with my auntie. So I have, I have happy memories and I have sad memories um, around Alzheimer's and dementia and the effects that that, 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 have, that has on people. And I suppose just to come on, I mean, most of us here in this chamber will talk today and will have some experience of Alzheimer's or dementia in our life. Um, when we look at the statistics for Northern Ireland, we're all bound to have something. And I mean, the motion today, it, it's not only here that we want to highlight this special day, we want to hi highlight World Alzheimer's Day, but we also want to encourage not only our health minister, but all of our executive to do whatever they can um, to promote um, living well with dementia. Because as I said there earlier, people can get it of any age group. We have people who are working, um, who are bringing up families, who have diagnosis of, of al Alzheimer's, and um, none of us know. None of us know what's ahead for any of us. And I know certainly over the past six months, um, the impact of COVID-19 on people living with dementia has been devastating. Um, we also know that in Northern Ireland, over 30% 30, 30 of those people who have died um, had dementia mentioned on their death certificate. Now, I don't have the statistics, some others in this room may well have them, um, to say how many of those deaths were in care homes and how many of those deaths were in their own homes. And we know there's issues, and that's for maybe another day and another debate um, for the Health Committee um, when we look at care homes and how, um, how that has manifested itself during COVID-19 and some, some, 19 and some of the feelings around that. But also I know during COVID is the social, social isolation has been a major factor for many people um, suffering or living uh, with dementia. And not only those living in private nursing homes or residential uh, accommodation, but all those living at home. And I know for, I've spoken to many friends and family who have said they had to make judgment calls during COVID-19 um, to go and visit their parents because they knew um, that for some of their parents and their, their elderly relatives, um, that the, the social isolation, the lack of confidence, was going to play a major part on how they would come out the other side of COVID-19. So I know there's been many families have had to make those judgment calls and, um, and, and doing them for the right reasons. Um, I know um, many members will be very glad to hear probably that I left Health Committee because I did like to wax lyrical about my pre-life before I became an MLA. But I'm just going to mention just a, a little bit there. Um, before I was in MLA, I worked for our wonderful health service. I'm very proud to say that I worked for them. And I worked in elder care. And I had many wonderful experiences working in elder care, um, especially with people um, who were, were living with dementia and their families. And I, I saw then firsthand the lack of services that we have in place for those people, uh, the lack of respite. The, the, the lack of care provision. And I, I saw a, a fact somewhere within all of that paperwork about the, the care costs in Northern Ireland. And it said in my paperwork that 120 million was spent in 19, 2019 on health care, 340 million on social care, and 350 million on unpaid care. And, you know, we have, I mean, I've been here since 2011, and we've had various policies, strategies where we've looked at dementia, we've looked at pathways for dementia, and um, we, we're still coming up short. So for our, our own health minister, who's not here with us today, I know he's in a meeting, but I mean, I know it's not a new problem that has landed on his table. It has been around for a number of years, and it is something that we still have to grapple with, and we still have to make a difference in people's lives, because we want people to have healthy lives. We want them to live longer, but we need to put that support in place, not only for the person living um, with dementia, but also for their carers and the amount of unpaid work that they do. And without them, our health service would fall absolutely to his knees. Um, just before I, I finish off, I, I just want to say also there is some good work as well that is being done. It's not all negative. There is some good work that's being done. And back at last year, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive was awarded um, from the Alzheimer's Society 
the uh, Dementia Friendly Large Organisation of the Year here in Northern Ireland. So I think that's something that we should shout about and that we should be proud of, that that organisation took it uh, on them to do the training, um, the, to recognise whenever they're sending someone out or when they're dealing with anybody with dementia and how to deal with it and you know the right way to, to do that. So again, I think this is something for our entire executive, not just our health minister. I think it is something that the entire executive needs to take on board. Um, we know, and I'm sure somebody else said later on about the figures as we go forward into you know years ahead. Um, just how many people we will have living here in Northern Ireland with dementia and the, the amount of money that will cost to manage that. Um, so we need to put uh, efficient plans in place now um, to deal with that. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Here, I'm Sarah Colum Gildew on Lord. I call Colum Gildew to um, and, and I am delighted to be associated with the motion today and to have asked to be. This is, this is an area of huge importance to all of us and I think uh, to all of our society. Um, I too met with, with the Alzheimer's Society in the, uh, in the early February time and I have to say that they, as they always do, impressed me with their, their level of detail that they have around this. Um, we know that there are over 100 and 14,700 people living with dementia currently, and that, that figure is expected to rise to uh, 20,000. So this is, this is an issue that we are going to have to grapple with. I have to say from my previous role as a social worker, within, also within, within uh, the older persons team in the South Throne area, I worked with very many families who were struggling with the issues that, that, this, that dementia brings with it, and indeed the additional um, pain and, and worry that people have when they're, when they're trying to plan cure for their loved ones. Um, they're trying to negotiate a lot of issues around um, a capacity to make decisions and how you can include that person's own voice and that person's own wishes within, within a, a setting where maybe family members have different views and the person themselves has, has very strong views, but it can be difficult with all the other pressures for everyone's voice to be heard and for the, the devoted issues for that person to be uh, dealt with in a way that reflects everyone's wishes fairly. I have also come across in my time as an MLA of some very serious issues in relation to deprivation of liberty that arise from dementia care and I have to say at times I have found um, the, the health and social care system can be difficult to navigate for people who are trying to um, explore the wishes, the wishes for their loved one, and also to retain as much of their normal way of living or way of going on as we often talk about here. That people, you know, sometimes um, it can be easier to just wrap people in cotton wool, and that that gives everyone the comfort of knowing they're safe. But people maybe are not being able to live lives in as full a way as they previously were, or indeed in as full a way as they are still capable of, despite the, the issues of dementia. So I think there are issues there that we need to look at how we engage with families and support families in that. I also know from having worked with them in, in my social work role that the Alzheimer's Society provides fantastic support to a range of people um, and, and in fact provide bespoke individual family planning sessions which I have found invaluable because one of the things I discovered as a social worker was the services aren't always there and very often it's the community and voluntary sector that you're relying on to provide uh, additional input into cases and they do that very well and I think we need to ensure that they are uh, supported to do that. Um, I'm conscious that within the, uh, the Power to People report that there is, um, uh, uh, they have flagged up the issue of curers' rights and that we need to see curers' uh, rights being put on a more statutory basis, that curers have the right to know what, what to expect and what they can expect. And I am currently working and I would hope that many members who are here today will join with me in terms of putting together an all-party group on curers. I think it's very important that that, that is uh, an area of focus for the Assembly because it impacts so many of us and because of the huge amount of cure that informal family cures are providing to the system. We need to uh, reciprocate and recognise that and support those cures. Um, I also think there are other, other cross-cutting issues in terms of even, even in terms of how we do planning and planning a dementia friendly towns and cities and streetscapes in the future and there are some very very simple steps that we can build in to um, planning that, that will allow people to 
continue to live at home longer, engage in their community longer, and I think it's very important that we try to gather in that learning and implement it in a way that we have genuinely cross-departmental uh, cutting. And I, I do, I do recognise the minister hasn't been able to be here today, and no doubt would have been, and but that. While it is, there is a focus on him to lead that, that all, other, all of our other executive colleagues should assist with that. And I would also urge the Minister to consider the, uh, the issue of, of CARES legislation and to try to bring that forward as soon as is possible. So I would like to support the motion and I welcome this debate today and the chance for us to, indeed, as Alzheimer's and World Dementia Day say, let us talk about it. Aram Sir Dolores Kelly, Hon I call for Dolores Kelly to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I um, thank uh, the DUP for giving up their slot uh, today in order to be able to progress this cross-party motion on Alzheimer's Day. Uh, like previous speakers, um, this uh, is something which is very dear to our hearts. I think there's very few of us who don't have uh, family members who are currently uh, suffering from dementia, and in my own case, it was actually my grandfather who had pre-senile dementia, and his uh, symptoms started to uh, be on display from the uh, age of his late 50s, actually, which then uh, points to the increase in numbers that we're seeing in society today of younger people with dementia in their 50s, and in some indeed in their 40s. And I know it's there are, Alzheimer has many, uh, dementia has a number of different um, causes. Uh, there's vascular dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, and there's Lewis body dementia, which is a particularly nasty, not that there's any good one, but it's a particularly nasty one. And I have a, a friend who's currently having to care for a 69 year old husband who's receiving uh, that dreadful uh, diagnosis. But it does uh, demonstrate that there's a need to have tailor made services and there's a, a lack of uh, support services, particularly for people in the younger age groups who are maybe only in their 50s, but the majority of people within the nursing homes or the care sector are in their 70s, 80s plus. So that, that is a particular area of concern. And also, as, we know, as many people know, uh, people with Down syndrome in particular are living uh, much longer uh, lives, thankfully, but some are also having, um, suffering then from uh, dementia in their 50s. And that's another specialty, a niche market, if you like, an area where there's particular needs uh, that need to be addressed. I know that uh, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on uh, both um, people with dementia and their carers. And we hear the stories of people not understanding why they can't see their loved ones and don't understand FaceTime, but also has put a sharp uh, spotlight and focus on the social care sector, an area that has been neglected. I think here in Northern Ireland we are more fortunate where we have a joined up health and social care sectors across as compared to uh, GB. But nonetheless, uh, I think the social care sector in particular has suffered from a huge lack of investment. And, um, I, I want to raise um, with the Minister's Department, unfortunately I know he would be here uh, had that uh, been possible, but um, th there is a huge problem uh, as we are struggling um, to get back to some sort of normality uh, or the new normality uh, uh, over the coming weeks and months, uh, that the support mechanisms have not been put in place for uh, families, not just for families who are caring for loved ones with dementia, but also for the daycare services, for the rehabilitation services, for the home health services. So we haven't heard very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, about how health trusts are actually um, responding to the particular challenges of COVID in, in working with uh, carers and in supporting them and in giving a quality of life uh, to those who are suffering from uh, dementia and other illnesses. The, uh, the uh, other speakers have said about the need for investment, as I also have, but some of the asks from the Alzheimer's uh, survey are not about uh, necessarily big money investments, they're about doing things differently, about uniformity across trusts so, and consistency across trusts. Uh, it, it is, as uh, Mr Gilding, you said, about preparing and, and being able for people to get their diagnosis early so that they can make informed decisions. How many of us in our constituency offices are faced with uh, people coming who have not had their wishes uh, uh, presented in their wills? 
and have been huge, a subject of family disputes. Uh, and sometimes the law uh, isn't very clear in terms of you know, at what uh, point of reasoning, if you like, can a will be made and, and adhered to. And uh, I, I know of at least two cases that I've had to deal with where there have been disputes and it has been uh, going to be fought out in the court. So I think there is an element that we need some clarity around the legal system for people who, uh, who want to have uh, informed early decisions, but also at a time whenever other people are trying to interfere in those wills and testament that there's a halt and that uh, we see that the, the Law Society and others are given very clear guidance uh, to their membership in terms of uh, uh, giving um, um, the correct the direction to, to families to and carers to, to ensure that the dementia sufferers' uh, um, wishes are adhered to. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I don't believe that there is one word in this motion that anyone in this House today could disagree with. For those people whose families are not directly impacted, dementia is often a catch-all phrase. However, in reality, there are over 200 subtypes of dementia, but of course the most common being Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. But across the types, the impact can be debilitating. It can rob people of their memories, their thoughts, their relationships. It can also be particularly difficult for the families affected as they can only watch while their loved ones remain often physically healthy but mentally slipping away. As our population ages, there is no doubt that dementia is going to become a growing problem. So we should be planning and taking steps now to prepare for that. Dementia is perhaps seen as like some sort of a new medical condition, but in reality, it has always been among us. The reason why we are so aware of it, and I doubt if there is a family that has not been touched by it, is testament to the success of our NHS and its medical practitioners and increasing the life expectancy of our citizens over recent decades. It is an invisible condition in the early stages and can be excused as simply being the forgetfulness that we associate with the ageing process. However, it is a condition that has no regard for age or any social condition or standing. I believe that over 22,000 people are currently living with dementia in Northern Ireland as many as 1,600 of these sufferers are under the age of 65, and that reinforces the point uh, made earlier by Paula Bradley. Thankfully, there is much more awareness of it now, so the Ulster Unionist Party would strongly support continued efforts to dementia-proof our health service for future years. That should start with our health service staff so that they can spot the signals and perhaps preempt the very practical but important challenges of communication and surroundings. There is no cure. The only comfort we can draw is that, unlike back in the day, when much less was known about dementia, patients could have found themselves in a lockdown ward of a hospital or even in an asylum, with no stimulation to help them through the day. Now we have nursing homes that deal exclusively with the care of dementia patients and have staff trained to deal with patient mood changes. There is also a growing body of evidence to suggest that it is possible to reduce an individual's risk of dementia. Research both here and in the UK and internationally suggests that smoking, excessive drinking and lack of physical activity, for instance, can all contribute to a higher risk of an individual getting dementia later in life. With this in mind, healthcare practitioners and public health bodies can aid the population to reduce or mitigate the risk of developing dementia, along with other conditions such as diabetes. Finally, it would be remiss of me not to mention and pay tribute to the many tens of thousands of people locally that care for people with dementia, both family members, staff members, volunteers, and support groups and associations. Without them, our social care system simply would not be able to cope, and there is no doubt that the quality of life for those that they care for would be severely impacted. It is important to note that it is not a failure when a family has to make the hard and heart-wrenching decision to allow a loved one to go into professional care. 
Curlers drive themselves to the absolute limit. They compromise their own health to keep loved ones in their own home. My family have been there. The Ulster Unionist Party have no hesitation in fully supporting this motion, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, I rise, of course, to support the motion, and we can see from the strength of feeling here today in the Chamber that I'm sure it will get all party support. As many have already mentioned, one key aspect of the motion is carers. It is estimated by the charity Together in Dementia Every Day, or TIDE, that carers um, for people living with dementia are, in effect, in effect paid 20 pence per hour for their work, yet their contribution in the most difficult of circumstances is invaluable to us all. The motion also talks about effective support in the home. This can be, to some extent, the luck of the draw. Some people live in tightly bound communities with plenty of neighbours around to help out. Others, it must be said, are less fortunate. The issue then becomes not just about lack of support, but lack of knowledge about how to go about getting support. That is why this motion implies we do need to raise awareness across the whole community so that people who develop dementia and their carers know if sadly the time comes that support is there and we do all we can to avoid people living in isolation. And um, I would at this point like to pay tribute to the dementia navigators. I came across a constituent probably about a year and a half ago who was at her wit's end. Um, she was caring for her husband and very isolated and I told her about the navigators and a few weeks later she phoned me back. A changed woman, she was absolutely thrilled with the support she got. So you know, the support is there, it just needs to be connecting the dots. We are relatively fortunate in Northern Ireland that rates of dementia diagnosis are amongst the highest and quickest in the UK. However, it remains perhaps harder than it should be to secure a diagnosis and the differential between trusts remains a concern. Diagnosis is vital for a whole host of reasons, not least to gain access to the right treatment and a pathway which can still enable people with dementia to live life to the fullest possible extent. If I may add one key point to the motion from personal experience, the issues for people with dementia and their carers often extend well beyond the health service and indeed well beyond public services. Managing to get phone contracts entered into accidentally or via scams cancelled as my father-in-law, um, I think at one point he had six phones. He just kept going down and taking out a new contract and then had to keep going back and explaining his circumstances. But he hadn't got his full dementia diagnosis at that point, so it was very, very difficult. Um, then moving on, then the next part of the process is recognising and making necessary legal arrangements for power of attorney and such like, and for all aspects of caring for people with dementia, which can draw little attention but can cause the greatest practical difficulties, particularly at the outset. Across all sectors, there needs to be awareness of dementia and particularly of the role played by carers, not just in caring directly, but also in managing so many other things, from access to the right health care to household administration and finance. And we must remember that a lot of these carers themselves are elderly and may have other health conditions. So it is, it, it, it's a very, very trying time in people's retirement year, years to, to deal with. We are right in this assembly, of course, to focus on the health service and the broad public services, but we also must recognise these broader issues. The key point, in turn, is that dementia brings with it for people who live with it a significant change, which often leads to other difficulties, such as depression. Itself quite possibly undiagnosed amongst those in the early onset stages. For carers too, it brings a form of living grief. Organisations such as the Alzheimer's Society, Dementia UK and TIDE which began operating in Northern Ireland in the last year or so, are all increasing their work in this area, having realised it is such a vital issue. So when we speak of removing stigma, there is also the stigma for carers, or at least a sense of not wishing to trouble others with their own sense of living grief, which we have to consider as well. It is something we all need to be prepared for, given our ageing population and the inevitable increase in the number of us who will have to care for people with dementia. This is why I'm keen um, to support this motion for dementia-friendly neighbourhoods, and there's some great work goes on in my own constituency in South Belfast around this, where thought is put into how we get everyone involved, the police, the shops, the schools, all the voluntary organisations, to make life easier for people with dementia and their carers in everything from ensuring ongoing access to services and assistance through to designing streets and shops. 
in ways in which they can continue to get out and about and be independent for as long as possible. This is an enormous challenge for us all, but one that matters a lot, and I support the motion. Thank you. Okay, I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I rise to support the motion. I want to thank the members from across the House um, for bringing this to, um, to this House on this particular day, which is, of course, World Alzheimer's Day. For any of us who have watched someone with dementia and watched the dementia process or progress over time, this motion really does resonate. While many illnesses, whether it be cancer or COVID, are cruel, I find personally that dementia is just that, it's cruel. Cruel on the sufferer, cruel on their family and their loved ones, hugely challenging for those tasked with caring duties. We do have a problem here in Northern Ireland, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it is the rising prevalence of dementia within our society. While statistics indicate that just shy of 15,000 having a diagnosis of dementia in here in Northern Ireland, this could actually be much more, maybe even as high as 22,000, as the proposer has already mentioned each one representing a loved one, a family, a duty of care. And while this represents a huge challenge, according to the LSE, that could be a much bigger problem come 2040, when they estimate that we could have a 95% rise in cases and some 43,000 people suffering from dementia. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, what we do now simply won't meet the need and the challenges faced with such a potential rise in cases. Therefore, we need to be looking at a new strategy. We need to be looking at it now to meet that growing demand by 2040. Currently, we're using a 10-year-old strategy, but as we learn daily now, science changes, treatments change, data and research can revolutionise how we care for people and secure better outcomes for patients. We need to look at substantial investment in this area of care. By 2040, we could be looking at a cost of £2.3 billion, to help achieve this, it is vital that longer-term reforms are interlinked, such as the review and reform of Northern Ireland's health and social care and independent nursing and residential care homes, taking due account of cognizance of the dementia needs in our communities. We must also provide the support and recognition that our unpaid carers are due and deserve. These heroes, and they are heroes, must be supported and not taken for granted. Their role is vital in not just providing care, but also in maintaining that independence and that home living that so many dementia sufferers value so much. The demands on these people is significant, and it must not be forgotten that while it's a physical demand, it's also a significant mental and emotional demand. Therefore, we must ensure a blanket of support is around our carers, and I would urge the Minister, and I'm glad to see he's, he's arrived in the executive meeting, to specifically look at how carers right across society can be better supported and recognised. Mr Deputy Speaker, my colleagues will also address other aspects of this pressing issue, but I cannot press enough the need for action now, for the patient to be first, for the families and carers to be supported. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. And can I thank um, all of the members and the parties um, who have been involved in bringing this motion to the Assembly tonight? Um, just listening to Paula speak earlier on and, and some of what Dolores said um, about your own experiences um, has triggered some of my own personal thoughts about a family member who is living with dementia um, at the moment. And I'm sure that a lot of us um, in this chamber can relate to, to those issues. Um, I fully support the motion and the efforts of the members to work towards a truly dementia-friendly society. Um, some of the figures involved have struck me not because they're high in number, but because these numbers and statistics do not show the full picture. And the figures have already been quoted by a few of the members that there are just under 15,000 people on the dementia register. However, that is a conservative figure with the estimates already quoted of 22,000 being suggested by the Department of Health itself. It's so important that the stigma and the pressure around dementia care is addressed not only for the person with the diagnosis, but also for their family, for their carers and for their community. And I wish to pose a question to every member here today, one which I suspect or I know at least one of you or some of you have already faced or will face in the future. And that question is, 
what would you like your personal reaction to be if you heard that your loved one got a dementia diagnosis? Would you like it to be one of anxiety with concerns about who is going to help with the potential current responsibilities like collecting medication or helping with household tasks? Or would you want it to be a sense of relief and of hope? And I believe that we should be doing all that we can to ensure that it is the latter, where there is a feeling of relief that your loved one finally has that diagnosis and more, more importantly, a suitable pathway of support and care, where there is a feeling of hope that with that diagnosis and that recognition, that you'll see the supports and the changes put in place to allow that person to continue to live a fulfilled life. I strongly believe that is possible, and that is what I believe a dementia-friendly society is. And of course, as other members have also referenced, this will require a broader executive approach with all individual ministers and departments stepping up to that task. So I look forward to hearing from the minister, particularly on his plans um, to reform social care and delivering accessible and supportive services for those with dementia. And I'm very happy to support this motion. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Over half of the UK public know somebody who has dementia. Many of us in this chamber know somebody or someone or probably have a family member who also have dementia. Dementia is a life-limiting disease with curative with, without curative treatment. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for over 50% of cases, vascular dementia accounting for 20%, and the remainder including frontal lobe dementia and alcohol-related dementia. When a person has dementia, the brain nerve cells are damaged and die faster than normal without replacement. It is a worldwide health issue with 35 million people and cases reported in 2010, a number expected to double by 2030. From information from Alzheimer's Research UK, there are some stark statistics with over half a million people in the UK with a dementia diagnosis, with uh, around about 15,000 people in Northern Ireland having a dementia diagnosis, uh, although separate research has indicated, as other members have said, that that could be 22,000. Um, from 2006-07 to 2015-16, the number of people on the dementia register rose from 9,500 to over 13,000, an increase of 43%. One in three people born in 2015 would develop uh, dementia in their lifetime, which, if reflective of this chamber, 30 members out of the 90, if born in 2015, will, de will develop dementia, which is quite frightening if you actually think about that. In 2014, one in 14 of people aged over 65 have had dementia in the UK and one in 79 of the whole population across the United Kingdom. Um, in Northern Ireland, there is 73% local diagnosis rate, which is significantly higher than any other part of the UK. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is also a huge financial cost associated with care. London School of Economic Care uh, Policy and Evaluation Centre are calculating that in 2019 care costs, as were mentioned, uh, were £120 million for health care, £340 million for social care and £350 million for unpaid care. Overall costs will increase by 192% by 2040, with a total annual cost of £2.3 billion. Regional Dementia Care Pathway is currently established by the Health and Social Care Board to set out a vision for improving the services and support arrangements currently available for people with dementia, their families and their carers. It aims to deliver on the recommendations of the 2011 Northern Ireland Dementia Strategy, Improving Dementia Services in Northern Ireland, which was published in 2011. Dementia Improvement uh, Collaborative was also established by the Health and Social Care Board in spring 2015. This recognised the need to make improvements in dementia care, particularly in the area of addressing waiting times for memory assessments and follow-on reviews. A Health and Social Care Board review of dementia services in Northern Ireland recognised the need to develop a standardised dementia care pathway to ensure high-quality care in the right place 
and by the right people. Dementia Innovation Lab was also established in the summer of 2015 to review the long-term implications of dementia for Northern Ireland. However, the current dementia strategy for Northern Ireland is almost a decade old. It is time to rethink and redouble our approach. Much of the good and valuable work being undertaken across health and social care trusts has stemmed from the 2011 strategy and recommendations. We need to assess whether this is still relevant and ensure the evidence base is up to date and most of all, all patient centred. We want to see the traditional focus on tackling service expanded from just a simple care provision basis to a dementia friendly approach throughout all our homes and communities. At present, there are real barriers to people with dementia accessing important community services and activities. We need to change public perceptions of this disease in order to make tangible differences to the quality of life of those affected. It is vital that we take steps now to put in place approaches, ambitions and sustainable funding arrangements to meet the rising demand in coming years. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. Iram Sir Martina Anderson on Kainche. I call Martina Anderson. Going me August, Tommy Kainche Fawer and Ruan Shaw. I rise to speak in favour um, of this motion, and I welcome the motion, especially today on Alzheimer's World's Alzheimer's Day. As Pam has said, there is no doubt that dementia is an utterly horrendous disease. Witnessing the shock on a loved one's face when they realise they have just repeated themselves, noticing the quiet panic when they realise that something is wrong with them but they don't know what it is, seeing the frustration a loved one expresses when they cannot remember something or they forget what they wanted to say or do. Like Paula and Dolores, I too will recount my own personal story. I, along with my family and a fantastic team of carers to whom we are truly indebted, cared dearly for our mother, Betty, who suffered from Alzheimer's for 17 and a half years. Bit by bit, we lost the strong, strict, independent mother who looked after us as we, her children, began to look after her. Sometimes we felt hopeless, trying our best to hold on to the mother we knew and loved, showing her pictures, singing her favorite songs, or talking about her past to trigger memories. But day by day, more of my mother's memories slipped away. And while she forgot some of our names, we never forgot her. She was our mother until the day she died. Families, as recognised by this motion, need effective community and home-based support. Whether they are large families, blessed because they can share the caring responsibilities, and even they struggle, and I can attest to that. I know that to be true, and I also know that smaller families who must opt for residential care so that their loved one gets the care they need. This motion says we need to prioritise and enhance the health and well-being of every person living with dementia and that of their carers and calls on the health minister and his executive colleagues to implement a dementia-friendly approach to their responsibilities in decision-making. I can attest that the system needs reform, serious reform, and if it is to adopt such a dementia-friendly approach. One of the things it could do is to accept a family's and carer's ability to know the right size of even continent pads for their loved ones. The system takes it out of the best of families as they make them jump through hoops wait weeks and months on assessments and form filling before the right size of pads are approved. Families are struggling for far too long as they wait on domiciliary care packages to be approved. Minister, that needs urgent attention. It's a cocktail of emotions, an aching hurt, because someone you love cannot speak up for themselves and they need you to be their voice. Yet, it's like howling at the moon as you are left feeling utterly helpless as you endeavour to make their lives just a little bit better. Just because they suffer from dementia doesn't mean that they have lost their right to dignity. My mother, four stone in weight, not able to walk, talk or feed herself, 
cried out tears with fright when the system insisted that she be hoisted out of her bed rather than manually lifted onto a chair and wheeled into the bathroom. And if we, we refused the hoist, the cares would be withdrawn. We needed those precious cares. It's cruel that families are given ultimatums at a time when they need the support the most. That is just one example of the failings within the system. Whilst this motion will not end the pain and the suffering dementia causes, calling out bad practices, trying to end the stigma, and stating that local services must be more accessible is so necessary for so many people. Everyone in this room, if they have not done so already, will probably one day need access to such services, either for themselves or for someone that they love deeply. Go in, Mead Marga. Thank you. I call Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Before I move to my remarks, I declare that I am the proposed chairman of the APG on Terminal Illness, which is currently awaiting the approval of the Standards and Privileges Committee, and have previously sponsored the Walk for a World Without Dementia event in this estate. Prior to touching on the substance of the issue, I wish to commend the Alzheimer's Society, Marie Curie and East Belfast Community Development Association, who have worked extremely hard with others to make East Belfast dementia friendly and teach us what it's like and what in practice can be done to assist those with the condition. It's because of work like this that I lament the loss of the Radar Centre, which was such a fabulous facility for practical demonstration. I am advised that over 14,700 people are on the dementia register in Northern Ireland, although the true number of people living with the condition here is estimated to be closer to over 20,000. Occurrence of cases is expected to grow significantly in the years ahead due to our ageing population, as we have already discussed. Dementia accounted for 13% of all deaths in Northern Ireland in 2018, and it is important to note that that number was 11% higher than in 2016. We can and should expect the trends to continue in tandem with the growing prevalence of the condition locally. Evidence suggests there are a number of issues and barriers which prevent some people with dementia and their loved ones from accessing the appropriate high quality care and support they need, including at the end of life, and it is the end of life on which I wish to primarily focus. It is estimated that around 70% of people in care homes have dementia or severe memory problems. Care homes have, and will continue to be, the setting where a large number of people with dementia spend the end of their lives, and it is therefore critical that care home staff have the experience, skills and training required to deliver high quality palliative care. Unfortunately, and while some homes do their best, this is not always the case. High staff turnover, inadequate staffing levels and lack of access to training due to time pressures and funding issues all make it difficult to equip care home staff with the skills they need to provide complex care to dying residents. Many care homes provide excellent care for residents with dementia, and Palmerston in my own constituency is a shiny example. But this is not universal. It is vital that improving knowledge and competency in palliative care and supporting people with terminal conditions like dementia is prioritised as part of the social care reform agenda. Now I turn to the context of hospitals. People with dementia will often be living with other comorbidities and complex needs. While emergency admissions to hospital are sometimes necessary, the symptoms of dementia make hospital a uniquely ill-suited care setting. The busy a &E environment and disruption resulting from emergency admission can exacerbate confusion and cause serious distress to the individual and their loved ones. It is therefore in the best interests of many people with dementia that emergency trips to hospital are avoided or minimised where possible, especially when they are approaching the end of their lives. In 2015, it is estimated there were over 2,560 emergency admissions to hospital in Northern Ireland among people with dementia in the last year of their life. While some of these admissions will undoubtedly have been necessary, it is also reasonable to assume that a significant number could have been avoided with greater support in the community. Action to address this issue and build up greater resources and care capacity in community settings should be pursued as a matter of urgency across health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland, in my view. 
finally, I wish to address the matter of support for dementia carers. Caring for someone with dementia is a demanding experience. To name but a few, carers will largely be responsible for tasks such as providing personal care to their loved one, administering medication, collecting prescriptions, preparing meals, maintaining the home, and coordinating care among a wide range of different health and social care professionals and providers. In many cases, this role is 24-7, round the clock, and can leave carers feeling burned out, especially as many dementia carers are spouses who are likely to be in the older age categories and living with their own health complaints. Training and information to help them perform their caring role and access to respite is therefore vital. Mr. Speaker, I had other, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I had other remarks, but I'm going to conclude by saying this. It is clear then that some people with dementia in Northern Ireland, as well as their carers and loved ones, are missing out on the high quality care and support they need throughout the disease trajectory, including at the end of life. With so many more dementia we'll deaths expected the in the coming years, to close, it's critical please. that we address these barriers and gaps in care as a matter of urgency. So I commend colleagues for bringing this issue to the House, and I'm proud to support the motion. And, uh, I suppose the, o- the only disagreement there's been in this debate so far is the, the numbers of people here in the north who've actually been diagnosed with uh, dementia. It's varied between uh, 15,000 and 22,000 plus. But one thing is for sure, and I'm sure we all agree on it, is that given our age and population, the numbers of people diagnosed with dementia is going to increase very significantly over the next number of years. And, and, and that's something we're all going to take account of. And everybody here has had some experience or another uh, in relation to dementia. Some very close members of families uh, have been diagnosed with it. I remember when we were youngsters, uh, my mother's aunt uh, had to come to live with us because she had dementia. And eventually, with four kids about the house, uh, it was just impossible for my mother to look after. And, and that decision that Alan talked about, when families have to decide to uh, put their, their, their loved one in care, that that had to happen. And I also had a, a friend, uh, not much older than me. He was, he, he was a great athlete in his youth. Uh, he played soccer for distilleries, one of our top strikers in, in the 70s. And he was also captain of the Antrim Gaelic football team. Uh, and he was diagnosed in his early 60s with a, 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 a very aggressive form of dementia. And as it turned out, he died a few months ago from COVID. Uh, and that's another one of the issues that we need to take account of. It does appear that dementia is one of the significant f- uh, risk factors uh, in terms of contracting COVID. So uh, those are some of the things that we need to take account of. And uh, it, it was also mentioned that back in 2018, almost uh, 15% of deaths, all deaths, were attributable to uh, dementia. And dementia, of course, is uh, an incurable, progressive uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, As I say, there's no cure for it it yet, and I'm sure there's plenty of research going on, but uh, to date, nothing has transpired that's going to cure it. And symptoms may start off as quite mild uh, and progressively get worse, or in some cases, where it is an aggressive strain, uh, the, the deterioration can be quite quickly. And as the condition deteriorates, there is a need for greater care uh, and greater support uh, for people who are caring for the, those who are diagnosed. And it's critical that we address the deficiencies in care as a matter of urgency. And a lot of the problems have already been, been touched on. Uh, in, in care homes, for example, uh, I think it was Joanne Bunting mentioned, up to 70% of residents in care homes uh, are suffering from uh, dementia of, of, of one degree of severity or another. And many people in care homes are seeing out their last days there. And the staff need the appropriate training and skills to deal with people at the end of their lives. And we all know of excellent care homes uh, that are doing that. But of course, there are other uh, care homes that aren't so good. There isn't uh, a universal uh, level of care right across the piece. And I suppose that's no great surprise 
given that in, in, in the care sector there is a large turnover of staff. Often there are inadequate staffing levels in the first place, and there is an act, a lack of access and time for staff to take up the training. And of course, there are always funding issues. In fact, uh, uh, curves in the care sector are often at the very bottom rung of the ladder. There's no uh, sort of career progression for them. They receive the minimum wage and so on and so forth. So, certainly. Thanks to the member, as well as the points that he raised there. We also share concerns raised with me, I'm sure with himself, about some care home owners refusing to allow people access to trade union and allowing trade unions actually into the site to organise. Uh, and I, I, I would have no disagreement with that whatsoever. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to provide care home staff uh, with the, the training and the skills that they require uh, when you know, they're trying to deliver and provide a complex uh, end of care life for patients who are literally going to die. Uh, so it's important uh, that the proper resources are put into uh, our care sector. It's important that our cares are supported. And those who uh, fortunately are able to remain at home it's important also that the people who are caring for them get the proper support that they need and deserve. Uh, and there's a high incidence of, of mental ill health issues among carers. Often, often the carers are themselves elderly. They're not in great health uh, and they face burnout. Ask the member to draw his remarks to and, the uh, There's a, high, uh, a, a higher than average number of those carers who take antidepressants. So we need to address the issues, we need to deal with it, and we need to deal with it urgently. Carmelo. I call Stuart Dixon, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased today to, to speak on the motion under my name and the members and parties right across this House uh, to seek a dementia-friendly approach uh, to daily life. Today is World Alzheimer's Day, and it is time to break the silence on this issue. Put in motion work towards a society that supports people living with dementia and their carers in every way possible, including research to find new treatments to halt this cruel disease. There are approximately some 22,000 people uh, in living with dementia in Northern Ireland, and I doubt there is a single person here today that is not aware of dementia in some form. Personally, I have seen former work colleagues face the condition as well as a close family member who is in the care of the Northern Health Trust, and his family are very grateful for the trust which, for, to the Trust for the care which he receives. I have seen the strain at first hand that this places on individuals and families. So today, Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to the thousands of carers across Northern Ireland who help to ensure the well-being of people living with dementia. It has been a particularly difficult year but our carers helped to keep our society going, and we must never forget this. Unpaid carers need better support from our health system. Paid carers need fair pay and conditions for the vital and difficult job that they do. We must not shy away from talking about dementia and what we can do to make the lives of people living with dementia and their loved ones better. That means ensuring their well-being and their dignity but also, where possible, ensuring inclusion of dementia sufferers in decision-making about their futures. I believe everyone here wants Northern Ireland to be a model of best practice in supporting dementia patients and their families. We want our society to be inclusive of people with dementia. One of the greatest examples is in my own constituency, a dementia choir set up by my Alliance friend Alderman Geraldine Movena. Geraldine is a Midnight and East Antrim Borough Council member, but she is also that Council's dementia champion, and it shows what an impact that this role can have. The This Is Me choir is one for people with dementia and their carers or a member of their family, but it is also inclusive of those experiencing loneliness, widowed people and the vulnerable. 
The choir brings joy and companionship to those living with dementia and their families. And even during lockdown, they've been able to keep going online. I want to pay tribute to Geraldine and people like her for all the work that they do for people living with dementia in Mid and East Antrim and the participants of the choir. And I want to particularly again pay, place on record my thanks to the Northern Trust for their support of the initiative. We need to be diagnosing and managing di dementia earlier. GP practices, of course, are where we need to be focusing on this and referrals for patients. We need to ensure the system is well funded and accessible to all. The Department's regional strategy on improving dementia services has developed memory clinics in each of the trusts. So I would be grateful if the Minister could give us an update on how they are functioning in the current environment and how the work of dementia navigators is continuing. It is important that we ensure the wider public services are accessible to those with dementia and to ensure their dignity and well-being in daily life is made easier for those living with dementia and their carers. This covers a wide range of responsibilities, so it should be an executive-wide initiative and also ensure that local councils are included in decision-making so that key services are delivered at the local level. Mr. Speaker, in closing, dementia is not something we can ignore. Right now, it is part of our lives. We must ensure that consideration for those with the condition and their carers is integrated into the planning and delivery of services to ensure dignity and well-being for all into the future. Thank you. Here, Mr. Jerry Carroll, on count, you call Jerry Carroll to speak. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise uh, in favour of this motion. I thank the members for bringing it today, and also to stand in solidarity with those who have been uh, pressing and pushing for better legislation for many years to cater uh, for and protect uh, loved ones with dementia. Uh, proper review and reform of the measures in place to allow people with dementia to live fully and safely is long overdue. Um, and in particular, this debate, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I want to speak uh, to the situation facing people uh, with dementia in our care homes in particular. Uh, since the beginning of this crisis, those in care homes have felt the, the crisis very sharply. We know how many care homes endured the pandemic with little to no PPE at all for far too long, how little testing was put in place for those who arguably needed it more than most, and how residents were discharged from hospitals straight into the care homes without being t uh, tested. Um, I hope for the sake of residents and the carers involved that they will one day be armed with answers um, who decided that their care should be deprioritised and that hopefully accountability will follow. And, uh, and more, the Health Committee is, is currently looking at some of these issues already. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, there is one facet of this crisis uh, facing those in care homes, including dementia sufferers, uh, which, ha <coughs> excuse me, which hasn't been the subject of rigorous debate, uh, but which has had a debilitating impact uh, on their ability to survey this pandemic. Care home residents living with dementia have endured seven or eight months without seeing any of their loved ones. They have been calling for clarity and action on this matter, and the response um, has been found uh, lacking. Some families have been uh, stopped from visiting their relatives at their bedroom windows, where the car park visits have also uh, been banned, and access to carers has also been limited. While the restrictions behind this uh, are in place to stop car home residents falling ill with COVID-19, those with dementia and their families are speaking out about how some of the most vulnerable members of society are coming to uh, come to harm as a result of these measures, because they were not made in consultation with those on the front line of care. To me, Mr. Speaker, it seems incredulous that our bars and workplaces have been flooded with workers and potters that is deemed safe, but is not deemed safe for care home visits, which can alter the very living experience of some of the most vulnerable people in our society and our communities. Uh, and we are not just speaking about the elderly or uh, those who are vulnerable. Many young people with disabilities are in the same position uh, as well. Uh, and as the massive political drive to get the economy restarted has overhauled regulations, uh, those people feel utterly forgotten about. And uh, to be frank, they feel let down. Yes, I will go away. For raising this particular point, uh, I think there are increasing concerns about the level of elder ab abuse, which is quite often hidden. And therefore, I, I would appreciate his point is very well made in relation to checking in on uh, those who are most vulnerable. 
I thank the member for her point, and, and it's, a, it's a concern that has to be raised. And I thank her for, for raising it uh, today. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I want, I want to call on the executive and the minister to relook at the priorities going forward and to seriously consider where the recent spikes uh, in the pandemic are coming from. And I cannot see a situation where anyone could come to the conclusion that it is people with dementia or other conditions in care homes who are spreading this virus when compared with the thousands and tens of thousands of people in cities and town centres uh, every weekend. And if our regulations don't reflect uh, that reality, then the approach of this executive needs to be seriously reconsidered. Um, I just want to, in, in, in conclusion, uh, the, to welcome the correspondence and the work from the Alzheimer's Society and Marie Curie, who have also been referred to already, and who both contacted us to remind us of the scale of the people who have died um, with COVID, who had dementia, and the, the scale of deaths, generally speaking, from dementia in our society. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I now call the Health Minister, Robin Swan, who will have up to 15 minutes to respond. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I start by apologising for those who moved this motion and those who have already spoken before I was able to to join today's debate. I will review what was contributed on Hansard to make sure I get the full flavour of, of any contributions. And I would like to thank the members for proposing this motion, which provides us with the opportunity to consider the importance of dementia services across Northern Ireland. And it's notable and, I believe, appropriate that we're discussing this motion today on what is World Alzheimer's Day. I, since joining the Chamber, I, I've listened intently to those members who have spoken um, in support of this motion. And like many, I cannot fail to be moved by the various contributions, but also the personal experiences uh, that have been brought to, brought to the fore in this chamber today. Because too often, Mr Deputy Speaker, those outside this chamber forget that many of the issues that are debated in here are of personal experience and personal importance um, to us. So for the, the members who have contributed those very personal stories, I thank you, because it reinforces not just the message coming forward from this debate, but that when we speak in here, when we speak as politicians, when we contribute to a debate like this, we do so from a heartfelt understanding and the need and the desire to get things right, not just for society, but also for our loved ones um, as well. Because I think it has been referenced a number of times that ter the term dementia can be used to describe a number of symptoms including the decline in memory, reasoning and communication skills, and that gradual loss of skill, skills needed to carry out daily activities. And I think, as Ms Anderson contributed, that is where the frustration for many of those strong, strong personalities, the frustration starts to come into their lives and often is reacted. Uh, and families, that, that is, a hard, is a hard situation to manage because when they see a loved one starting to decline in that way from someone who they once were, and they see that change almost on a daily basis. M Mr Deputy Speaker, dementia as has, has been referenced here. It has a profound effect, uh, impact on the people who experience it and the families. And as, you know, as we've said and we've heard, all of us in this House will have no family members, friends or acquaintances who have been touched um, by dementia and the impact this has on those around us and, and the sufferer themselves. I think as Mr Sheehan's contribution, it is no respecter of phys physical activity, physical ability, because when the deterioration starts, it is something that, is, that needs managed, needs supported as well. So this, this is a cruel disease that can strike at any point to any person. So there is no, and I think as Mr Dixon uh, and others referred to, there is no cure for this, but it's the support that we can uh, deliver. And, I think one of the impacts of, of better standards of health care is that we do have now an ageing population, and this in turn means the number of people living with dementia is increasing. There are over 22,000 people living with uh, dementia in Northern Ireland, of whom 15,000 have a confirmed diagnosis, with as many as 1,600 people with a dementia under the age of 65 years. So it's not just age specific either. Mr. Deputy Speaker, every four seconds in the world, a new case of dementia is diagnosed, but I think as Ms Flynn's contribution um, reminded us as well, and Mr Sheen's, you know, the only thing we've disagreed about is the statistics. Let's not forget these aren't statistics. No, these are people, these are families, these are loved ones who have to support 
and endure what is a very cruel disease and diagnosis. But by that metric, if we continue at this rate, by, by 2051, the ageing of Northern Ireland's population means that the number of cases of dementia will rise to over 60,000. This is a major social, economic and health care challenge well into the future. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it is heartbreaking to think of increasing numbers of families enduring that unspeakable pain of watching those loved ones slip away, husbands and wives, even sons and daughters, finding their loved ones no longer e even recognise them, because it is that support and that support network that I think was Ms Cameron's contribution you know, of, of the heroes um, that we refer to, that we depend on, of Mr Dixon's contribution as well, of those who are there left to support. Or as Mr Sheehan also said, at that challenging point, and Mr Chambers, I missed the contribution as well, at that challenging point that comes to a family when they have to take that incredibly difficult decision that they are no longer able to cope and that they have to look, look elsewhere. Because I, I think, as has been contributed, there is no current, currently no cure for any type of dementia. But recently there have been significant advances in our understanding of the factors which contribute to prevention together with improved diagnosis and the treatment of dementia. For longer than should have been the case, this awful condition has been mistaken simply as a part of the ageing process, because across the four home nations and in the Republic of Ireland, political administrations have continually identified as a priority the need to promote greater understanding of the causes of dementia, to work to find a cure, to modify the risk factors and to improve standards of care for people living with dementia. Mr Deputy Speaker, as has been referenced, my department has produced a regional strategy, albeit back in 2011, with the aim of improving services for people with dementia and their carers. This strategy, amongst other things, helped to develop memory clinics across the five trusts that Mr Dixon referred to, which provided timely diagnosis for people with dementia and information and support to inform decisions about their future care and treatment. The Delivering Social Change initiative was launched in September 2014, which covered three broad project area areas – dementia care, early intervention transformation and shared education. The Delivering Social Change Dementia Signature Project, which was provided a joint funding package of $6.25 million, some of that money coming from Atlantic Philanthropies, the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister and the Department of Health was a precursor to what this motion asked for, and that is the cross-departmental working and support of a dementia strategy. This was intended to transform the commissioning, design and delivering of dementia services into the future and improve the quality of care and support for people living with dementia. The legacy funding from the project um, provided £2 million recurrent, and that has been invested in the dementia service improvement leads, and there are two per Health and Social Care Trust. The Dementia Navigators, again, two per, per Health and Social Care Trust, and Dementia Companions, and there's 44 in total across the region. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Phase 1 was completed in March 2018 and included a number of developments that members may be aware of. There was a major public awareness campaign, um, The Still Me, addressing the stigma around dementia, 11 information booklets produced on a range of dementia related issues. There was a training programme for the health and social care staff actually on delirium and a new dementia website located as part of NI Direct. The training and development work stream, which included the recruitment of dementia navigators and champions, and that training covered 2,463 carers, and there was also the publication of the dementia learning and development framework. Um, and the second funding package, which is just over seven million, was made available through the Delivering Social Change Initiative, and that was referred to as Phase Two. That project um, included the development of technical solutions and training, communication, support to people with dementia and carers, data collection and analysis, research projects, data analytical projects. Um, because the aims of the program, Mr. Deputy Speaker, were to build on existing connected health infrastructure in order to improve the patient journey for people with dementia and better support for families and carers, and it sought to build the capacity and the capability to collect and use dementia data to improve the planning and delivery of effective services. Also as part of Phase 2 project, a dementia patient portal was developed, and that portal is to secure user-friendly web-based tools 
designed for parents and the registered carers to manage their own patient record and communicate with the health care providers. Phase 2 also provided resources to establish the general practice intelligence platform on the recruitment of an analytical team. Um, this will, amongst other things, allow the creation of a dementia disease register and provide an, an analytical platform to help improve care. Um, GPIP is a hugely ambitious development for the health and social care sector. When implementation is complete, it will enable the routine collection of a broad data set of granular codified activity and registered data from GP clinical systems. It will create the potential to establish multiple virtual disease registers and with data linkage to other hospital and community service data sets, which will enable the development of advanced population health data. Um, and that facilitates the vision, as was actually set out in the Bingo report of health and well-being in 2026. The sector, uh, and has been mentioned by contributors today, has facilitated engagement with people with a dementia and carers and been able to deliver flexible person-centred services um, across the region. I know that, for example, um, in my own constituency, uh, and Mr Dixon referred to it as well, the Northern Trust is committed to helping businesses adapt their services to meet the needs of people with dementia and their carers. They work with the councils, the Chamber of Commerce, the Alzheimer's Alzheimer Society and many other partners to raise awareness and deliver training and support to many businesses to become dementia friendly. To date, uh, they have made a difference by establishing dementia friendly town centres in Coleraine, in Ballymoney and Ballycastle and in Larne. And in addition, uh, the villages of Glenarm, Ballygally, Carnlock and Cushendall have participated in dementia-friendly information sessions. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the work is going on. Uh, I think Ms Bradshaw referred to you know, Northern Ireland Housing Executive has been awarded a dementia-friendly organisation. And again, it, it's the importance of local government as well, as Mr Stewart, um, Mr Dixon, so apologies, also referenced as well, was the contribution his party colleague, Ms Geraldine Movena, makes as the, the Council's dementia champion and the work she does through the, the This Is Me Choir, a very valuable asset, not just to the council area, but to those people and those families who engage with it. As with other services, responding to the current pandemic has had a major impact on the delivery of dementia services, which is being reflected in, in increased waiting lists for initial diagnosis and reviews, but also in the provision of residential, day and domiciliary care services. Necessarily, health and social care trusts have had to rethink and redesign the way in which they respond to people with a dementia and their carers. So too has the voluntary and community sector, and there has been evidence of imaginative person-centred practice which must not be lost when this pandemic passes. I will, yeah. Mr. Forgiven Way, I'm sure he, like many of the rest of us, are dealing with PIP applications. I just wonder if there's a delay in diagnosis, and yet, you know, the condition is so obvious in a sense, and the demands that it places on carers, whether or not he would consider writing to the Minister of Communities to accept, you know, a GP indication that the person's on the wait list for a confirmed diagnosis in relation to dementia, because that would allow carers to buy in additional resources to help them in their caring role. It's certainly an issue you'll look at and engage with the Minister for Communities now that the member, member has raised it to see if there is an easier way and a better way to support those, those who are waiting the diagnosis but also the support that is needed for the families as well. Um, in regards to the regional dementia care pathway, 14 of the recommendations in the regional strategy refer to the development of the memory services. And in order to address these recommendations, an agreed dementia care pathway has been developed. It is important to note that specific work has also been taken forward to ensure that the pathway supports adults with learning disabilities who also develop a dementia. Although no funding has yet been identified to support the implementation of the pathway, integrated care partnerships, local commissioning groups and the trusts have been working with the voluntary and community sector, uh, people with a dementia and, dementia and carers, to establish service innovations and prototype sites in each of the, the trust areas and full implementation of the pathway is likely to be achieved across the region within the next uh, number of years. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as members have really uh, 
registered and, and, and spoke about here from, from Ms Bunting to Mr Carl. Um, the impact of p people with dementia in the care home setting, especially at this, this very challenging time. There has also been particular impacts on those uh, with dementia in care home settings and their relatives, as the challenges that have presented with visiting restrictions. While a necessary measure to try to prevent and control the tr transmission of COVID-19 in care homes, there has been very difficult, uh, it has been very difficult for care home residents and their families. At this time, such guidance must continue to reflect the executive's priority to minimise the risk of tr transmission of the virus in care home settings, but also recognise the very real need for residents and families to see each other. In this context, the guidelines published by my department are intended to support visiting while also balancing the ongoing risks posed by COVID-19 yeah, no to ask the, residents, the Minister staff, draws remarks to and close families. Me. Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, I am happy to support um, this motion uh, in the way it was brought and the members who brought it as well. Thank you. Now, before we move to the next member to wind, I have a few uh, additional comments to extend the sitting. Just um, as business on the order paper isn't expected to be disposed of by 6 p.m. in accordance with Standing Order 10.3, I will allow business to continue until 7 p.m. or until the business is completed. Okay. Thank you for that. I guess next year, I'm Sir Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, not much faith in me sticking to my 10 minutes there, but I'll try and get it through in, in that time. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to wind in this debate today on promoting dementia-friendly policy within the North and, and to speak in support of the motion as well. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the things that we quickly learn when we uh, enter public service as elected representatives is the scrutiny that our lives are placed under, whether it's through the media or increasingly through social media. The life of an elected representative is often seen by some as a life detached from the lived human experience. However, I am sure that everyone within this chamber has encountered the devastating effects of dementia on someone within our own lives. And I think that certainly from my time, being in this assembly, I think this debate has been something where I've heard uh, all sides, all people talking about very personal stories, and I think that that allows us to show the real human side that there can be to politics as we've discussed this issue, and it has actually been uh, a very nice debate uh, and motion to be part of here today. I um, welcome the fact that it's a cross-party. Uh, motion that is here today, and I thank the DUP as well for foregoing their turn uh, in the system within this House to be able to allow this uh, cross party motion to be here today. I think that sends a really clear message to what has been described to tens of thousands of people right across the North that are impacted either by the condition or uh, by those that are caring for people that are living with that disease. Uh, I think the fact that we have all come here together today to be unified in our approach uh, in discussing this and caring about the people that are impacted, uh, I think, has been a particularly nice um, touch. Um, it is heartbreaking. Uh, the condition takes the people that we cared about and breaks them down into somebody that we must care for. Current statistics show that there are approximately, and we've had the range from 14 to 22,000 people living with the condition, uh, and those estimates may just be the surface. There may be many more. Uh, we have highlighted as well and been told that dementia is a part of and accounting for around about 13 per cent of all deaths here. And with statistics as shocking as those, we really uh, does give a picture of the heroic work that has been done by those within our care homes at present and why a dementia-friendly policy is needed so badly at present. So many care homes uh, are providing excellent care round the clock on a daily basis, but we have, as has also been recognised, it is a sector where there is a very high turnover of staffing, and I suppose that continuity is critical uh, in working with people with dementia, understanding uh, how you can care for them, working out the individual quirks that they have to be able to make their life more comfortable uh, is easier done if you've got long-term staff. So trying to challenge that high turnover of staff within the care sector is something that we should be doing. And it's maybe in, in a part 
to the low wages and the difficult conditions, uh, but it is something I think that we should be uh, working to eradicate. To say that caring for a loved one or a patient with dementia is not easy would be an understatement. The demands that it places on a carer are monumental uh, as you try to make sense of the condition that is so cruel in its affliction. Cares for such a person can go through a range of mourning as well, as was highlighted. They mourn for the person at the outset of the diagnosis and knowing what there is ahead. They mourn as the condition develops. A once patient and gentle person may become aggressive as the condition uh, continues its assault on their mind. They mourn for the life that the person has left behind, and finally, they are left to grieve the passing of that person. We understand that in one third of all the COVID related deaths, dementia was also on the certificate. And I know that the Health Committee, of which I am a member, will conduct an investigation uh, into the care home sector with COVID. And hopefully, we can examine to see if there is any practice that can be uh, replicated or improved to be able to help those that have dementia. Yes, of course. Member for Given Way. Just on that basis, um, placing dementia in today's current COVID scenario and others, the Minister and others have rightly pointed out about that difficult decision that a family have to make when they feel they can no longer care for that person or that loved one. And those decisions are possibly being postponed or delayed because families have that hesitancy that they don't want to put their loved one into a care setting under such circumstances. And perhaps that's something that we will see come out in the weeks and months ahead. I thank the member for her intervention. And, and absolutely, it is such a, a critical step, such a massive step to actually place a loved one within a care home. Um, but to do that under the current circumstances uh, would be very, very difficult and a decision that families will put off and put off and put off. But again, that may be to the detriment of the care overall for the family uh, and for the care of the loved one. Um, this helps me to dovetail into my next uh, paragraph, which is about those living with dementia and their courage often feel isolated, lonely and forgotten. This is uh, unacceptable and one of the cruelest ironies, I think, of dementia, that those who care uh, for those that have lost their cherished memories are often the ones that are forgotten. Um, certainly within the ethos of the SDLP and others, uh, has long been one which brings people in from the cold and does not forget them. And I commend the work of my colleague Sinead Bradley uh, in the work that is taking place on the APG uh, with loneliness. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is anticipated that the projected numbers of dementia diagnosis will double by 2040, uh, with the North actually being the highest region for that projected increase. Therefore, our response uh, to this uh, disease and its being undiscriminating illness must increase proportionately to be able to deal with that. I know that this was a cross-party motion, and what I'll do is I'll just uh, take a few of the points that were made by one rep from each party, just again to give that breadth that we, uh, it is a cross-party motion that was signed up. Paula Bradley began by highlighting some of the true impact uh, of dementia, which can be children left behind, husband and wives left grieving, and that is a real uh, concern for people that they know maybe years in advance uh, whenever the condition starts. She also mentioned the roguish spirit of her grandmother, and I couldn't help but feel that that's maybe a family trait and there's something in the genetics there, but we, I'm sure we can continue to find that out. Uh, and again, you, you started off, and many, many others uh, mentioned how the importance of help and support for carers is absolutely critical because they're contributing a great amount to society by taking a massive burden off the health service as well. The chair of the health committee, Colin Gildner, highlighted the impact of the condition on those suffering and mentioned some of his professional work as a social worker and social workers right across the north as they try to help families. And he also highlighted the importance of the charitable and voluntary sector. And I think many of us got um, photographs today with some of the charitable sector, voluntary sector there as well, to help support them in the work that they do. My colleague Dolores Kelly mentioned the issues and concerns around COVID and just the impact that it is having. And I, I know the Minister in uh, what was a very extensive and detailed response, and it was 
uh, a, a, I think, a ministerial contribution that told us lots and lots of the things that was happening and occurring and taking place and the help and the support that is there. Um, and that's good because sometimes I suppose ministers come in to be defensive and talk about the things that they're trying to do. But I think that there was plenty of detail in your response and I know that it will be appreciated. Um, I know that Dolores mentioned about the limited visits that there are for people in care homes and how that's having an impact. Alan Chamber mentioned the impact of living longer. People are living longer and therefore it is a condition that we're going to see an increase of. And Paula Bradshaw mentioned that how support is available and various projects and hi highlighted the dementia navigators and how they can help. So I suppose matching people uh, to the help and support that there is available is a critical uh, job for all of us to do because um, people may be feeling lonely and isolated but there is help and there is support out there and we should be trying to uh, connect them together. Uh, it has been highlighted as well that no patient should be left waiting more than nine weeks for dementia services. Uh, we have to reduce that because we know in some trusts that we're not hitting that target and we must do all that we can to try and pull together and provide the support uh, through the executive and through this house so that trusts are able to get that number right down because as somebody else had mentioned, I forget who it was, that there was a uh, um, there is early diagnosis is key to being able to provide the appropriate services and interventions. Uh, I've said as well that COVID-19 is teaching us many lessons about healthcare, about caring, loneliness and isolation. Unless we're willing to learn from these vital lessons and more importantly to act upon them, the to then we will be to doomed close, to repeat please. them. All those who receive care, whether at home, in a care home, in hospital or in hospices, are deserving of every dignity that we can afford them. Members, we cannot lose sight of this, and I support the motion that's presented today. Okay, members. Uh, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Okay, I think the ayes have that one and the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the business on the order paper. I invite members to take their ease while we prepare for the urgent oral question to the Health Minister.